investments. Having said this, we will now do a problem where we will use the expression of energy in terms of stresses, but instead of actually showing you the expression, we will uh, have it come up in just a little bit. The problem we want to solve is of a plate, a rectangular plate, which consists of two different layups. There is one layup in the middle and one layup on the outside. Dimensions are shown here, 2A, 2B, with little letters and 2A, capital and 2B, capital 2B for the inner layup. And they can be anything they want. And we will also define normalized coordinates. Xi is X over 2A and phi is Y over 2B to simplify some of the calculations. It's simply supported all around here at the edges, outer edges. And we apply a constant force on one end NA, which is the far force divided by 2B. Remember, N is force per unit width. So I apply a constant force F, which divided by my 2B width gives me the applied NA. And we want to calculate the stresses everywhere in this plate. Now, why we want to do that, we'll see in 15 minutes. Continue. We'll actually look at the news again. It goes back to December, but uh, we'll eventually catch up with the news of today, but not today. Airbus and MIT look to digital manufacturing to reduce aircraft construction costs. That's great. Could composite aerospace structures be assembled much like snapped together building blocks. You know, it's my, my, my son's paradise. I mean, Legos. <clears throat> Rather than manufactured as large, expensive one-piece parts. Now, we will revisit what it says here, large, expensive one-piece parts um, in a little bit. Hopefully, if I remember. Under a new research agreement, Airbus and the MIT will explore the potential of digital manufacturing and aircraft construction. Aircraft manufacturers are increasingly adopting composite materials to reduce aircraft weight. Current composite airframe manufacture involves the fabrication of large single piece parts and expensive process. Okay, let's <clears throat> talk as we go. Composite manufacturing <clears throat> is significantly more expensive than metal manufacturing even today. So you guys are the experts. We've taken 10,000 courses and I would like you to tell me the reasons why composite manufacturing uh, is more expensive than metal manufacturing. I have uh, 45 people here that are refusing to give me any idea. I'm going to talk to your parents. Yeah. Okay, okay, but even if I automate, I mean, the, you have to think, okay, the automation itself, let's, since you mentioned it, uh, the automation does not give you um, the same efficiency as in a metal because you are not as flexible yet. The automation equipment, robots and fiber placement and so on is not as flexible as what you might do machining a metal structure. But okay, that's automation. I am say even if you did have automation, we are not still uh, competitive enough with metals. Okay, now we have a whole bunch of more steps in the process, and that's important. Any other? Back again? Uh, we need to apply safety factors, with okay, and that, that's actually indirect, but it's reasonable. Uh, the safety factors, or at least the uh, requirements, are more stringent with composites, impact damage, and so on. And that typically adds weight. And every time you add weight, usually you add, not proportionately, but you add some cost because you have more material you are putting in and more time you spend to put that material down. Other reasons? I want at least one more. Way back there. Okay, very good. The cost of raw materials, uh, it's at least a factor of 10, even in the cheapest form, it's at least a factor of 10 more expensive than the cheapest metals. In fact, uh, aluminium is about uh, uh, one to three um, uh, dollars per pound, so that would be pounds. Two pounds so is about two to six uh, euros per kilogram. Uh, steel is about half that, but we don't use much steel because it's very dense. And titanium is even it's about ten euros per kilogram. Now composites, the cheaper composites, if we are on a good day, would start at about twenty 
to 25 uh, euros per kilogram. Now some people will tell you I have this miracle material which is based on natural fibers uh, and uh, matrix that's uh, just a variation of water. Yes, there are materials, but those are not strong enough. Those have not been demonstrated to last 30 years and so on. So the good materials of today, composites are expensive. Having said that, that doesn't mean that that's the main reason. In fact, the reasons are more what the front here said. But raw material is usually about 12% of the total cost. So if the raw material is 10 times more, it's still you are paying more for the final product. The steps in the process and the complexity of having to make a part that's not flat anymore adds a lot to the cost. So composite manufacturing is expensive and there's one aspect of the manufacturing process, the assembly. If I make something, I need to connect it with something else and the assembly process is quite expensive. In fact, roughly you can assume it takes about a minute per fastener and to put something together. So if you have thousands of fasteners, there's thousands of minutes worth uh, spent. You might argue, okay, I will do bonding, but if you do bonding, then your structure cannot be easily demonstrated to be damage tolerant. You cannot prove today without destructive testing that any bond line is not the so-called kissing bond. Basically, if I have perfect coverage with adhesive, it does not mean that the adhesive has adhered to the parts that it's going to connect to. And there is no non-destructive method today that's been demonstrated to work in those cases. Therefore, if you choose to go with a bond line in primary structure, you will have to demonstrate that if you lose 50% of it, you can still meet limit load. And usually that's too heavy to do. And you end up having to put fasteners, the so-called chicken fasteners. That's why it's chicken because we chicken out. We know that the adhesive is strong, but we cannot prove conclusively that every day we will make the same part with the same process. We will not miss something and we won't end up with one bond line on one part being um, a kissing bond. So we use these fasteners, which allow us to go from limit to ultimate load, essentially. And those are the chicken fasteners. Assembly, therefore, uh, which will involve some form of fastening most of the time, will uh, add to the cost. And in order to avoid the assembly part, we try to make the parts of, out of composites as large as possible. If you make a lot of small parts as in a metal built-up structure, sheet metal structure, then you can connect them with rivets and everything is fine. The process is well understood and reasonably fast. If you try to do that with composites, you have the raw material being expensive, you have the extra steps you have to go through the process, especially if you don't automate, and the cost of, the, of assembly. So if you can remove the cost of assembly by making, by making larger parts, now you can start making your part more competitive. So there's a bit of a problem uh, that I have because this is contradiction. It involves the fabrication of large single piece parts. It's done on purpose. If I am making small parts, I have to assemble them. If I have to assemble them, I am adding cost. So the manufacturers are smarter than the article writer here in that we want to make as large parts as possible to eliminate fasteners, which also helps on your aerodynamics and so on, and to reduce the cost and make the cost of a composite part competitive now to a metal part. The fuselage of the A350 XYWB, for example, is made up of a number of large composite panels which are then joined together. That's an interesting problem, and let's see how much you guys know about composite manufacturing or manufacturing in general. If I'm, I'm trying to make a fuselage which has a circular cross-section, option number one is to make it in a single piece. Let's assume that you have the money to have the mandrel or the mold that you can cure it in a single piece. Option number two is made in two pieces which are connected, here and here, let's say. Uh, option number three is to make it in four pieces. Now, any of you following the 787, this is the option they selected. And I'm pretty sure A350 is very close to the same one. So knowing what these guys did, can you tell me what's the best approach? Now, be careful, of course, if you say one of these two you have a good reason, because otherwise we call Airbus and Boeing and tell them we found a solution. So um, which one is the best? 
And why? A room of 45 experts here in them. Production perspective, okay, I agree with you. Production perspective, cost perspective, and... Okay, you think uh, the gentleman over there. Okay, that, that's very good. I would cause it, call it risk-related. Um, this is a big fuselage, even if it's a barrel, so the length perpendicular to the page is not very big. This is huge. If something goes wrong during the whole, all these steps that were mentioned that I have to go through and I either don't notice or it's too late, then I waste millions of euros in labor hours, parts, materials, and so on. The risk associated with this is, is very, very large, not to mention what I skipped, of course, that may creating a mandrel of this size and making sure that it gives you the right geometry with the proper heat up rate during curing it, it can be quite challenging. So this is not the way to go. How about this one? compared to this one now. Remember, we said the fewer the parts, the better, because the assembly is less. But we already said that if we make them too few, the risk is high. So obviously, I have two extremes here. But there's one more reason, which is related to one of the words you mentioned. I make one half here and another half there, which presumably are identical. One. Okay, but that's an afterthought. But it's, it does help to have more lines or to uh, move tr cracks around if they grow in the wrong way. But before that, you, suppose I made these and they are nominally identical. They come even from the same mold. Now, when I come to connect them, they will never match. There will be, if I match exactly at the top, usually there's going to be a gap one way or another at the bottom. You might say it's small, it might be only a few millimeters, but few millimeters, if you try to close that gap, is few millimeters worth of a bending moment you put in, and you don't want that on top of your other loads. If you have four parts, whatever problems you have, let's say you connect these two, when you connect these and these and these, you can d divide the overall tolerance problem in more locations, and therefore at each location you will have less of a gap. So if you do it in a smart way, when you connect these, you don't just connect one and keep on doing that and you collect the complete tolerance here. You do it in such a way that you actually bring it together almost simultaneously, and then you can remove the tolerance problem or reduce it significantly. So these guys, I think, are reasonably um, conscientious of the cost issues and the implications of assembly, and that's why four pieces is probably nearly optimal. Some people might talk about three, but uh, I, I wouldn't know. So there's a reason why there are large pieces, and it's not because we can't do it differently. It's because it's actually, given what we have today, the best way of doing it. The digital material concepts being developed at MIT could lead to lighter weight structures and lower construction and assembly costs. Now, this is a great promise. CBA is the center for, for BNA, but I don't remember what BNA <laughs> A, I think, is art, because basically what happened is this gentleman, Kenneth Chung, finished his PhD last year, I think, in the Department of Arts and Sciences. And that's where it's another parenthesis. Uh, Architects and civil engineers. Architects are the major problem of civil engineers because they come up with concepts that are structurally completely unsound and they expect the civil engineers to find a way to solve it. At the same time, some architects will come up with some nifty concepts and eventually when you implement them, it might give you a really nice result. So I think this is a case where someone coming from not a aerospace or structures related background uh, used a lot of imagination and being a very an innovative person, came up with a concept that actually has a good chance of not being a nightmare for the structural engineers, but uh, they, the story is still, or the jury is still out. Reversibly assembled cellular composite materials. Okay, so you basically create a 3D lattice of mass production. I'm doing it on purpose. I'm going slowly and I'm not showing what it's all about. See if I can keep you awake on a Friday afternoon. So he produced flat cross-shaped composite pieces that were clipped into a cubic lattice of octahedron called a cuboct. So if you do a search under cuboct, you'll find some pictures. 
here's the interesting part. The parts form a structure that is 10 times stiffer for a given weight. So stiffness to weight is 10 times better than existing lightweight materials. So now I'm starting to get interested and excited, obviously. And they call them digital composites because you can build them up with from specific units and it's like ones and zeros and you can create anything you want. The MIT technique allows much less material to carry given loads. The cost of construction and assembly would also be lower. That's where it's going to be interesting. I'll show you what the, uh, the concepts. Oh, important, very important. Unlike conventional materials, uh, the structure will fail locally because you have all these little elements that make up the structure and you break a few of them, but there's enough of them around to take the load. So that could make a very damage tolerant design. It also makes it easy to repair because you just remove the portion that's damaged and because it's all modular and you can add to specific locations very easily, then you can add any piece that's broke. Okay, but what exactly does it look like? So this is the building block, which is this gizmo here. It's a flat piece composite. It has a slot in the middle here and then these shaped um, lugs, whatever you want to call them, with slots. And they put them together any way you want. And one example shown on the right uh, there. So you can create a construction which will have pretty much any shape, of course, still maintaining aerodynamic shapes and how you will put a skin over it. It's not clear, but it's still at the beginning. So I have my doubts and questions, but last time I had doubts about a good idea, I was completely wrong. So I am refraining to publicly complain. I showed this to my son and he said, can we get these Legos to play? Yes. Uh, I actually, yeah, measurably scaled it. It's about, you can make it in different sizes, but it's about this. So that would make it 15 by 15 centimeters or something. But you can make it smaller. Um, so you can create all these wonderful things. You know, this is the architect. They come up with all these conceptual things, and now the structures guys have to make sense of them. So it's an interesting proposition, and um, it's also interesting that Airbus is jumping on this. Uh, because I think it's too early to make a uh, investment or a commitment in terms of, okay, for the X number of years, future years, we'll work on this because it's very promising. But it goes to show that if you think of weird things, uh, sometimes uh, people will believe you and get excited about it. And that is the good thing about some architects, not all of them. So uh, where am I? I can't see. We are going to solve this problem, and the reason we want to solve this problem, I need to find a way to get the sun out of my eyes, is that there is a class of problems that we can directly relate to this. Uh, the first and easiest one is suppose I have a plate which has a rectangular cutout in the middle. So basically my center laminate in this case is zero, is nothing. Or I have a plate in which in the middle I have a stiffener which just terminates in the middle on both sides. It doesn't extend to either end. In this case, the local stiffening effect of the stiffener could be represented by an other laminate of different D matrix properties. Or I could have a plate with two stiffeners at the edges. So now it's the same as this one, but imagine the inner layup extending all the way to the edges, so the green part. The outer layup will be the two stiffeners plus the skin. So this would be my outer layup and the inner layup will be the center portion shown here. Or I could reverse that and um, end up with the stiffener in portion or the stiffened portion in the middle. Now it, you can show if you just do a few trial and errors and that's how we started working on this is that you can come up with significantly higher buckling load in a configuration that has two laminates, one in the center and one around it, if you pick the laminates carefully, obviously, with the same weight. So it all of a sudden comes up as an uh, interesting alternative, and it would be nice now to come up with a solution that doesn't require finite elements every time. Yes? In practice, how well can you manufacture such a layups? Uh, well, if my each skin portion between frames is half a meter length and depending on where you put your stringers it, you have stringers every 15 centimeters let's say so you can replace even a single bay 15 centimeters by 
50 centimeters by this and if you just put a strip of material in the middle to represent the uh, middle layup you are saving on the stringers and you are increasing the buckling load it's not as easy as I made it sound but yes you can make it uh, and in uh, many cases it will work but it's not a blind thing let's just add material here because you will soon find that your buckling load goes down after a while while you are keep uh, you keep adding material so it's not an easy problem to find the optimum <clears throat> you will assume that the inner and the outer layers are both symmetric so there's no B matrix and that means that we have only a membrane portion of the energy and a bending portion of the energy when I was talking about the energy with the different parts and in fact uh, in this case we are only interested in the membrane we are applying an in-plane load and we're calculating stresses we are not doing the buckling check for the buckling check you would need the D matrix also instead of the expression I showed earlier so this is uh, which would require on displacement based you would need the top e equation here or the top line which involves the A matrix and that's the displacement based energy minimization approach if you do a stress based or force based then the exact equivalent instead of involving the A matrix it involves the little A matrix which is the inverse of it and it has this expression here Notice there is no A16 and A26 because we are assuming that there is no stretching uh, shearing coupling. So the capital A16 and A26 are zero, which means when you invert it, the little A16 and A26 are zero. If I use the energy that's stress-based, I have to satisfy exactly my equilibrium, minimize the energy, and then that will satisfy my strain displacement equations approximately. My equilibrium equations are shown here, and we've seen those before instead of stresses I have the forces per unit width but it's pretty much the same thing and I have my boundary conditions for forces which say that my NX at the two ends of the plate will have to be equal to my applied force divided by the width my NY at the two vertical edges of the plate has to be zero and NXY everywhere has to be zero so if this is my plate I'm loading in this direction I have a center laminate here and this is my X and this is don't even remember doesn't matter X and Y Y is going up let's say and X is horizontal then if I only apply the force in the X direction this edge has no force applied which means the NY and the NXY here are zero and exactly the same thing at the top NY and NXY zero also at the two vertical edges here NXY is zero also so hopefully that's what that says there yes those are the boundary conditions we have to satisfy now you can take my word or you can substitute and prove it that if you use this NX and Y and NXY you satisfy exactly the equilibrium equations and all the boundary conditions in fact the way I came up with that is I started with the NXY substituted in the equilibrium equations find nx and ny then substituted in the boundary conditions and then I fixed all my constants that I didn't know at the time so these expressions satisfy all the equations that we need to satisfy but the hmn coefficients are unknown and those are the ones that we will determine by energy minimization the energy as I just said before the complementary energy is this term but we also have the work done the work done is force times displacement work done by external forces which means I need to calculate my displacement at x equals 2a and I know my nx at x equals 2a because that's my applied na so there's one extra step here <clears throat> in the end I will take the derivative with respect to hmn and set it equal to zero I hope I have the derivation yes in order to do that I need my displacement u at one end of the plate so before when we did the first example last lecture epsilon x is given in terms of the a matrix and the nx and ny by this expression here so if I take my nx and ny from these expressions and I substitute in here and integrate with respect to x because epsilon x is du by dx I 
I can find my u will be in integral of epsilon x dx. So that's exactly why we are integrating with respect to x to find the displacement. And if I evaluate it at x equals 2a, I will find this expression here, which is also a function of the HMNs, which are still unknown. If I take the derivative with his, of the energy minus the work term uh, with respect to HMN and set it equal to zero, I arrive at a big matrix equation where the <coughs> first square matrix here comes directly from the complementary energy. This comes from the work done. Those are all known, and the unknowns are all in this vector of HMN. And that becomes a system of M by N equations uh, by M by N unknowns, where M and N now are the terms in the series that you use. And usually for this problem you need at least, uh, or about 30, at least 20 to get it to work. The reason for that, let's have a generic discussion on number of terms. If I'm trying to solve this problem, if the stiffness of the inner layup is similar to the stiffness of the outer layup, then if you think of what way this deforms, it's going to be as if you had, or close, it will deform in a way that's similar to a single material. It's when the stiffnesses are very different that will make a big difference because let's say the center portion was extremely stiff while the outer portion was very soft under some load. In this case, all the displacement will happen around here. So a point, you know, this line before, defo before loading would pretty much move. This point will stay in this location because it's attached here and this is very stiff. So it would actually deform like this. And similarly, probably something like this on the other end for this originally straight line. That part is the one that is very difficult to capture with a simple function of using a few terms. If I only use sine of pi x over a, one half wave, it would look like this, and it has very little capability of capturing this weird shape of the displacements uh, over there. So that's why you need quite a few terms. And let's do some, uh, we solved it. The, uh, we used some kind of matrix inversion or Gaussian elimination to solve the system of equations. How good is it? Again, we will compare with finite elements. The center layup, again, it's all fabric plies, has five, 545 degrees, two zero nineties, and then another five. The perimeter is thinner. It's the same as the center, but instead of five plies on the outside, it has a single ply on the outside. It's plain with fabric, and we're using a square plate, and then we are changing the center part to have different dimensions, 5 by 5 centimeters, 10 by 10, 25 by 25. And again, these numbers are weird because they, in English, units are very round, nice and round numbers. So here is my plate. The center square is here. And I'm plotting the NX, or the stress. If I divide NX by the plate thickness, that would give me the sigma X stress, on a transverse line, transverse to the load applied from the center all the way to the edge. And I get three types of curves uh, for the three sizes of the squares that we said we are using. So the um, points are our solution, and the continuous lines are the finite element ones. And you will see one important aspect, which is the stresses are discontinuous. And we started with the displacement assumption of a few pages ago, shown at the bottom here, displacement, I'm sorry, with this nx, ny, and nxy. These functions appear to be continuous, but when you actually f evaluate the actual HMN, you capture the discontinuity that the stiffness difference causes. And in fact, our solution is extremely good for this case and for uh, this one. It's a little less good, but still good enough for engineering purposes, definitely, for the uh, th smaller of the squares. So this one is the smaller square, five centimeters. This one is the intermediate size, and this one is the biggest. And you can tell the size by just looking at when the jump occurs. The jump is where you have reached this point. So this is at 0 0.5 uh, normalized distance from the panel center. So if this is 50, you can find exactly where that point is. So this is quite